All right, everybody, we're gonna go ahead and get started. I think there's still some folks coming. Um, so I'll start slowly. Welcome everybody to Make Your Own Ink. Uh, my name's Chad Brown and I'm a workshop assistant at the Center for Creativity. Um, tonight we're gonna talk about pigments, recipes, and tools that you can use to make inks for calligraphy, um, different kind of paints. Um, pigments can be used in a lot of different ways um, depending on the medium you mix them with. So we're gonna get into all of that experimentation um, in this presentation. And then later on at the end, we're gonna talk about how you can make your own calligraphy pens, uh, commonly called folded pens or cola pens. Um, and I'll demo that. So um, to start, I'll just talk about my experience, which is none. Um, I don't have a fine arts background. Um, I have no experience in making paint before uh, coming to the C4C and starting to experiment. So it's been an interesting learning curve all along the way. Um, but that's what's so exciting about it is just going out and experimenting. And once you start doing it, you'll never look at the world in the same way. You'll just see pigments everywhere. So let's get on with it. Um, so our objectives for tonight are to describe various types of pigments. We're gonna go over safety and equipment. Um, I'm gonna walk you through some pigment making processes that I've done um, and show you that the outcomes of those. We're gonna talk about simple DIY kitchen pigments that you can make yourself. Um, and then, like I said, make some DIY calligraphy pens. Um, I hope that all of you had a chance to look over the resources document that should have been emailed to you. If someone, if, if that did not get to you, we'll, we'll try to get that to you um, later on, but it had a lot of links and information about different recipes you can do um, that I'm gonna be referencing throughout and that you can um, do it in your own time because making pigments and making paint and ink is pretty time consuming um, as you'll see the more we go into this tonight. So some basic vocab, um, starting with earth pigments, which are pretty common type of pigment. Um, those are just simply made by grinding natural minerals. Um, common names like ochre, sienna, and umber, you might recognize from commercial paints. Um, those started as earth pigments um, that are just rocks and soil um, ground up and mixed with a oil or uh, different kind of mediums. Um, so those are kind of the, the oldest um, paints that, that human beings have um, and, and you can still make them today. Uh, like I said, some more people are joining us. So um, lake pigments are the next type that you're gonna see tonight. And those are made by a chemical reaction of pre precipitating organic dye with a metallic salt. And if you can't tell, I'm not a chemistry person either. <laughs> so here, um, basically that is um, taking organic material rather than minerals like rocks and clays, like I said, and um, fixing that into a solid that can then be dried into a powder. Um, so things like crimson, which comes from um, a, a certain insect, indigo, which comes from the uh, woad plant, uh, I'm not sure how you pronounce that plant. Uh, matter lake comes from the matter plant. Um, the root word lac is again from an, in, an insect. It's the same root as lacquer or shellac. Um, it doesn't have anything to do with lakes or ponds or water at all. Um, with lake pigment making, mordants become important. And that is a substance that sets the color of a dye into a media. So something you would add if you were dyeing cloth to make that color hold into the fibers. Um, we're gonna be using mordants uh, in a lake pigment process um, to make those uh, colors, which are usually fugitive, stick around. Um, common mordants are iron, tannic acid, alum. These are pretty common substances. Um, let me make this person real quick. Fillers are just substances that you add to stretch a color you know, pigments can be very valuable and you want to make them last. So something common like calcium carbonate, which is just chalk, um, can be added to make that color go a little bit longer way. Um, you might be familiar with that if you're a watercolor painter, 
Um, and you've used gouache before that has the watercolor with a filler in it. Um, binders are a substance that hold pigment and filler together in a cohesive state. Um, most commonly for inks and for watercolors, that'll be gum arabic. Um, you can use casein, which is an animal product. Um, oil paints simply use oil like linseed oil or walnut oil. So let's talk about safety because making pigments isn't very safe. Um, always, you always want to wear a respirator or a mask when you're working with powders, which we will be doing in pigment making. Um, you want to make your pigments as fine as possible. And so those things are really easy to breathe in. And I know in quarantine, we all have lots of cloth masks hanging around. So those are perfectly suitable for this kind of work too. Um, and you never want to aerosolize powders by blowing them off your work surface. Um, I know it's a really common thing to do and I do it too, but um, that puts them up, up in the air. Instead, you want to wipe them up with a damp rag. That's a lot, lot safer way to dispose of them. Um, always wear safety glasses when you're grinding. Um, some recipes call for caustic materials like washing soda and potash, which um, are very common. You can buy in a store, but they are slightly caustic. So you want to always know what you're doing and wear the protective equipment that's appropriate for those chemicals. Um, some chemical reactions can cause fumes. Always work in a well ventilated area. Don't inhale fumes, obviously. Um, Always can consult material safety data sheets for proper handling of your chemicals. Um, consulting material set safety data sheets um, will give you a little information on what you're working with. And it's, it's an extra step, but it's important um, to do your research. Like I say there, common household ingredients um, can create toxic reactions. Um, even something like peach pits. We interviewed um, an adjunct professor, Anna Castillo, who y'all might know from history and art and architecture for our podcast at the Center for Creativity. And she makes a lot of her own pigments and was working with burning peach pits. And that's something that we eat, but that created a toxic green smoke in her kitchen. So, you know, this is the kind of thing that you have to be aware of. Um, avocado pits, uh, peach pits, cherry pits, all contain cyanide as well, which is not a good thing to uh, ingest. So you just want to, you know, make sure you know what's going to happen when you start messing with with chemical reactions. Again, I'm not a chemist, so do your own research. All right, the first ink we're going to talk about is India ink, which is a basic and universal ink um, that's used in illustration, medical fields, tattooing, all over the place. And it's simply just soot and water. Um, so this is, India ink is common all over the world. Um, gets its name because it was first identified in East Asia, Southeast Asia, um, but it is found pretty much all over the world. Um, really fine soot doesn't have to be ground because um, the particles are always already so small. And um, you don't necessarily need a binder, depending on your um, desired result. Um, you can use gum arabic or something like that, but carbon black, which is the name for, for soot uh, pigment, is naturally waterproof just because it's pure carbon. Um, there are many ways that you can gather soot, and this is not just charcoal, but actually the soot that is um, aerosolized by combustion. So a common thing you'll see is um, holding a metal spoon over a candle and just that black burned bit on the metal spoon. That's the soot that you're going to gather and that takes forever, but it makes a really, really fine soot. Um, also commonly lamp black, uh, you'll hear that term. And that's the, the soot that gathers on the inside of like a, an oil lamp um, from burning oil. Um, also charring bones will produce a nice bone black. And uh, they used to put a big canvas tent over an open fire and collect the soot on the inside of the canvas and then shake it out um, to, to collect all that soot. So there's a lot of different ways you can go about it. Again, working with fire. So you wanna be careful. 
Um, that is a, a great way to get into ink making. Um, it makes a really rich velvety black. As you can see here in this picture, this is one of my first experiments with making India ink a few months ago. So similar to India ink is um, a technique called ink wash painting, um, where uh, soot from burning oil or pine wood, which is very has a lot of sap in it and thus makes a lot of thick black smoke, um, would be mixed with animal glue and left to harden into these ink sticks, which you can see here in this picture. Um, the solid ink sticks would be ground with water to produce the ink and like similar to watercolor painting, um, but you're only using black and like gradients and, and shades of gray produced from, from a single ink stick. Um, other hardening binders there are egg whites or rice glue, but traditionally it is animal glue. Um, and then often incense or fragrance would be added to the ink, ink stick. Um, and that covers the smell of the animal glue, which, you know, is an animal product and doesn't last forever, but it also adds to kind of the experience, um, uh, you know, when, you, when you're sitting down to do calligraphy or ink wash sumi -e painting, um, the grinding and the smell of the, the incense kind of gets you into the mindset that to, to make art. Um, so it's a, it's a whole kind of a sensory experience. So I'm sure you guys have seen this kind of uh, art before. This is a pretty famous piece. It's been practiced in Japan and China for centuries. And uh, as you can see, you can get some really cool, subtle gradients and, and fog and shadow effects with just black India ink, basically. Um, I want to also say that there's a, there's a huge record, and going back to the safety too, there's a huge record of European ink making that's the most easily accessible to us because it's in English, but it is worth researching uh, ink making all over the world because all cultures have been doing this for centuries. Um, and something like these solid ink sticks is not super common in the European vernacular, but these blacks that that uh, they were able to produce in China and Japan were prized all over the world because they were so rich and uh, characteristic of, of that region. Um, so it is worth looking everywhere you can for, for these kind of recipes. And, and it's just cool hist history. All right. So let's get into some earth pigments. Um, as I said, these are made from inorganic materials and soils. Um, I, I'll pause and say if there's any painters in the audience that want to correct me uh, on my descriptions of ochre, sienna, and umber, please do. Uh, as far as I can tell, as an as a amateur, they're just different proportions of iron oxide and manganese oxide um, that create a yellow, red, or brown color spectrums. Um, other earth pigments are lapis lazuli, which makes a color called ultramarine, vermilion, titanium white, which comes from titanium, um, and, and so many more. Um, this picture here is one that I am in the process of grinding in this picture um, from Westmoreland County here in Pennsylvania. Um, so these are you know rocks you can just pick up off the side of a trail or, or in your backyard even and, and grind them down in the pigments. It's pretty, pretty straightforward and easy. Um, so this, this is kind of the whole process of processing that, that ochre. I'm calling it an ochre because uh, it's kind of yellowish, but as you can see, it started as a, those thin sedimentary rocks um, and I'm just grinding it in a mortar and pestle um, using an old paintbrush to kind of uh, scoop out the finest pieces and then, and then um, sifting through a fine mesh strainer um, and then regrinding any pieces that, that didn't go through. Um, that to me has made a fine enough pigment for my purposes. You can also um, grind it with some water against uh, some tempered glass, which you can see in that last picture is what I'm actually working on, a glass cutting board. 
um, to shear the particles even finer um, before you actually mull it into a paint. Um, that's what's happening in the last picture is mixing it with a watercolor medium to make the, the finished watercolor paint. Um, that recipe that I use is in that resources document that should be shared with everybody. Um, but it's a natural DIY watercolor medium that's made from gum arabic and water and honey. All right, and lake pigments um, gets a little more complicated, but these are, like I said, made from organic materials. Um, so it, pretty much anything that is a dye can be made into a lake pigment with this uh, chemical reaction between an alkali and basic mordant. Um, so what I did for this here is an avocado lake uh, pigment. So you can see it's a, it's a powder made from avocado pits that were basically boiled in water, which you'll see in the next slide. Um, but I used alum and, um, and washing soda, sodium carbonate. Is that right? Yeah, alum and, and sodium carbonate. Um, so the alum is my mordant and that makes the dye color light fast and more permanent. Um, so it'll stick in, um, in the powder and then in the, in the paint when it's used. Um, whereas, uh, as you might know from trying, seeing leaves change in the fall or uh, if you have any experience trying to uh, dye things with organic dyes, they tend to turn brown. Uh, when they die and lose their chlorophyll. Um, that happens with uh, dyes and lake pigments as well if you don't have a, mor a mordant. Um, so common lake pigments uh, include carmine, indigo, rose matter, like I said, um, or avocado pits if you have access to those. So it's a bit of a more complicated process to make a lake pigment. Um, as you can see going from left to right, I boiled about six avocado pits um, in a liter of water, which produced this lovely dark reddish pink magenta, I don't know, um, dye. And that third picture where it gets kind of gross looking, that's actually the chemical reaction happening. And as soon as your alkali hits the, the dye, which has your alum, your mord basic mordant in it, it's going to precipitate and like create solids seemingly out of nowhere. It's kind of weird and crazy. And then it'll foam up and look like a mad scientist experiment and, and eventually settle down. But then you strain it through a coffee filter. Um, if you look down here, you can see it actually just pure clear water comes out. I wouldn't recommend drinking it because I don't know that it's actually water, but it is clear. All the color stays in that in that solid in the top of the filter. And then you can see that's drying out again grinding and sifting into a fine powder. Um, this down here is, is adding that watercolor medium on top a little bit at a time and then mixing into a, a watercolor here that's then put in in a pan and dried into a watercolor uh, paint. Let me sure I explained that whole process because it's kind of it's kind of uh, it's kind of involved and it takes uh, several days to to pull it off. <laughs> all right, uh, so here's a picture of just all of the watercolors that I've made. Um, I like watercolor; it's easy and um, approachable and cheap. Um, so you can see the, the ochre from Westmoreland County that I showed you. Uh, charcoal from a campfire. So that's not technically India ink, but it is a nice rich black ink. Um, I got an umber from Frick Park Nine Mile Run Trail, if you're familiar. Um, I even made one from a broken terracotta pot, which is that lovely terracotta color. Um, and you can see the avocado pit lake uh, turn into a, a bit darker of a purple. It, just keeps changing colors <laughs> as it dries. Um, it looks really dark there, but when it's actually used, it's, it's a lighter pink um, that I hope you'll be able to see. Um, and then lastly, just that calcium uh, 
carbonate. Um, I just made a, a basically a white watercolor uh, right there. All right. Well, before we go into, I'll, I'll leave the calligraphy ink up for a second, but I'll, I'll come over here and um, show you my swatches of all of those. Um, so you can see they, they came out. Those look like uh, watercolors. Um, so that one in the middle is the, that's the avocado. Um, so you can see it's, it's a really soft pink. Um, I think my favorite is this umber right here. It's very, it's like milk chocolate. Um, very nice, very, very smooth for coming from a rock. Um, all right, let's, so let's talk about calligraphy inks. Um, and you can check out this picture of some of my earliest experiments with that. Um, the only difference between these calligraphy inks and uh, these other pigments that I'm making is they, um, if you think back to the lake pigments slide, the calligraphy inks basically stop at the dye phase. And at that point you're adding your gum Arabic, uh, your honey, um, some essential oils as a preservative, if you like. Um, and they're gonna stay liquid instead of drying into watercolors or um, being stored as pigment powder. Um, so this is a really simple recipe. Again, links for this are in the resources document that, that went out to everybody. Um, this is some of my earliest experiments um, on the right here. The turmeric didn't come out that great. <laughs> um, even though spices seem to be really fine powders, they need to be ground even finer. You can see that one's even flaking away. Um, I made one from black tea uh, super concentrated right there. Um, and I was experimenting with uh, some cornstarch rather than gum Arabic as uh, a little bit of a thickening agent, um, but it kind of just settles out. Uh, it doesn't, didn't work out too well. Gum Arabic's the way to go. Um, and then the magical red cabbage, which I would recommend starting with. I know red cabbage is not the cheapest vegetable uh, in the grocery store, but it, depending on the pH of the solution, you can get all these different colors that like you see here. Um, it, it starts blue and purple and then will dry to a really dark, uh, really nice blue. Um, it's kind of amazing how it changes colors like that. Um, the one that's a little bit green there, you can see I, I have a note that I added washing soda to that to change the pH. Um, but I think what happened was I either added too much and went too far in one direction or I overcooked the uh, red cabbage and it turned kind of a ugly green, let's call that a swamp, swamp thing green. Um, so that's, I, red cabbage is really fun to play with. Um, but black tea, walnut husks, uh, oak galls and old iron nails that you can find around are, are good beginner's options for brown and black inks. Um, and typically brown and black things like black tea and, and oak galls and walnuts um, already have a ton of tannic acid in them. So they're naturally have a mordant and, and are fairly permanent. Um, oak galls and, and walnut ink have been used for calligraphy for like I said, centuries and they're still legible today. Okay, so this second half of this workshop is going to be uh, DIY cola pens. Now, um, these are a simplified version of a rolling pen, um, which was uh, which is used for rolling paper. So if you think about college ruled and wide ruled paper uh, from grade school when everything was written by hand, um, this is a, a pen that can do this fine even consistent lines. Um, and you can see a professional version right there. I've got it zoomed in on, on the nib in that second picture. Um, what we're making is a simplified version called a folded pen, which is also a type of ruling pen. Um, and in my research, I found that these were introduced in 1995 at a letter form convention, which is a, a typography convention. Um, and it's simply a piece of sheet metal that's folded in half and trimmed into a point uh, to to form a nib. Um, 
and this you can see on the professional one this cavity right here and then this picture is all pens that i've made um uses kind of capillary action to, to hold ink right there and slowly let it come out the nib um so these are dip pens and they hold a little bit of ink but they use a lot of ink um <laughs> they're very messy so i'm going to go to the next slide and show you the instructions um here in a second i'm going to go over to my work table and switch to the second camera which i'll be able to demonstrate the process for you um really simple just take an aluminum drink can and cut two corners off as you can see here fold it in half around your handle and tape it in place um this curved cut is important um because um a, a perfectly flat uh, uh, nib is never going to hit the paper perfectly. So if you have a little bit of a curve, uh, it's going to be a little more forgiving. Wow, there's a lot going on on my screen. Sorry. <laughs> I don't know if you guys could see that chat box floating around. Um, so like I said, this these things take a lot of ink and they splatter all over the place and they make a big mess. Um, they're good for making it's perfectly straight lines, but if you drag them sideways across the paper and use like the side of the pen rather than the tip, you can get really cool splattering effects and it's totally random uh, and messy and, and crazy. So I'm going to jump over to my other camera and um, demonstrate how we make these. So one second here. Okay, I, th I hope that you guys can hear me on the second camera here. If you don't, I guess Mike will let me know after a, a minute. Um, but uh, this is really simple. You can see just have aluminum can for a handle. I'm just using this little piece of a dowel rod, um, scissors and a Sharpie um, and whatever kind of tape you have, uh, blue tape or duct tape, masking tape. Um, so the basic square, you know, I already squared this off beforehand a little bit, but we'll say we'll make a nib about that big. Um, and if you lay the handle in here, you can kind of get an idea of how, how wide you want that folded part to be. So you want to just come around the handle a little bit. Say it's like there, and there. So let's say we'll cut off like that much. Not really an exact science, but you can get a lot of pens out of one, you know, soda can. So I'd say just go for it. coolest part of this whole process is not knowing what's going to happen uh, when you actually try to write with this thing. So carefully cut these corners out. Just there. I guess I should have said if if uh, y'all pre-registered and, and saw the equipments list and have this stuff prepared, you can follow along at home. Okay, so you can see it's going to fold around the handle like so, and then come together into a into a nib. So. Could have made it a little bigger for this size handle, but that's okay. So. I'm just going to take a big old piece of tape. Blue tape's probably actually not ideal but it'll hold for the 
the duration of this workshop. And we're just going to roughly, you know, attach the nib to the handle. And it's not going to be pretty, but we're making it on the fly. So that's fine. And this is, I'm going to get a piece of duct tape to make this stick a little bit better. Definitely not pretty, but that's okay. I'm gonna fold two sides in towards each other a little bit to get that that tip. So see that, and you now can make a decision about what kind of shape you want. Um, but I kind of want a small, smaller pen, so I'm gonna get a nice little curve like this. Um, and then come in and try to cut both sides at the same time. Just snip that right off. Try to do it in one go. So you can get a clean curve, as clean as it's gonna get for this very quick pen. <clears throat> So there you can see, easy as that. That took what, two minutes? <laughs> so we've got a calligraphy pen. All right, so now the fun part, the very messy part, I would recommend wearing old clothes and protecting your workplace. Um, we'll see what this thing can do. Um, real quick for this, I'm just using a commercial indie ink called Noodler's Black. Um, which I really like. It's supposedly archival. Um, so I'm just going to dip. You can see that. I think you can see. And it's pretty dark, but it is holding some ink in the in the tip there. So you want to get it nice and full. And then we'll see what this thing can do. So you can see I've got that flat bit at the end. That's what it's doing the writing. Oh, and then if you drag sideways, like I said, you can get some interesting kind of splatters. And every line is totally different and I already have to refill it. Calligraphy is really hard as a left-handed person, <laughs> but Almost write my name four letters before I have to refill it. There you go, Chad. And that's a pen I just made <laughs> in, in two minutes, like I said. Over here, I have all of the others <laughs> that I've made. It's a pretty addicting hobby once you get into it. These are all on driftwood, little stick handles. Um, so this is something that you can, you know, play around with. I mean, different, different nibs. This is actually my favorite one that I've made. Um, make different effects. You know, diff the the curve that you cut into it will do different things. This one is actually two layers. Let's see if it'll focus of aluminum. So it's a little stiffer, but it also does a lot more feathering, if you will. So I hope I hope that you'll give this a shot, and you know it's a good way to recycle some aluminum, I guess. But if you uh, are right-handed, you'll have a little bit easier time with uh, calligraphy and not getting the back of your hand totally black.
I'm gonna jump to the other camera here for a little closing statement. Okay, I hope you all can hear me again here. Um, so as you can see, like, just go for it. And uh, you, you won't know what, what the end product is gonna be either with your pigments or with these pens. Um, I forgot to mention in there that you can use ink you can use watercolors, you can try paints, any liquid in these pens, they're pretty forgiving. Um, but it's it's all a big experiment and, uh, you know, very messy, but a lot of fun. Uh, gotta get this chat box to go away. Just a second. So I can read my own final thoughts. Um, there you can see all of my pens lined up together. Um, I'm, I'm trying to do a little more like illustration uh, drawings with these rather than calligraphy writing because they do lend themselves to a lot of expression um, and experiment. Um, this one on the end is a little more complicated design that, that you can look up that's more for making black letter uh, traditional calligraphy. Um, but my final thoughts here, remember safety first. Um, I should have been wearing gloves maybe here, but uh, it, protect yourself while you're making these things so you can keep having fun making them. Um, I'd recommend keeping a logbook um, with notes and recipes where you found your pigments and your results so you can learn from that and also look back on, on everything that you've played around with here. Um, keeping a logbook is really fun and a great way to uh, you know, remember where you've been and, and where you came from. So um, like I said, there's centuries of ink and pigment making experiments out there to research. Um, the Internet Archive at archive.org is a great resource. Um, a lot of this stuff is in the public domain. Um, you can, again, extend your, your pigments with a white filler um, from chalk or ground eggshells, which I have yet to try, but you can grind up eggshells into, into your white pigment. Um, and keep experimenting. This is what it's all about. Um, these paints and inks that you make will be, you know, uniquely yours and no one else in the world will have them unless you share them. So. That's, that's something really special. Um, so thanks everybody for coming this evening. Uh, if you have any questions, I'm gonna pull up the chat again here. Um, you can let me know. And Mike just shared our spring programming, our social media, all that. So uh, see what else we have coming up this uh, semester. We've got a lot of really cool programming. Have fun experimenting out there. Hopefully the warm weather comes soon and we can all get out and forge some pigments um, when and where it's safe to do so. Um, thanks everybody for coming tonight and I uh, hope you enjoy the rest of your night.